Okay, we're ready to finish the Federalist era. We're ready for the a great screwed up election of 1800, and you will see why before we're done. Okay. Uh, by this time, we have two um, primitive, loosely organized, loosely defined political parties. Not anything really like the parties we have today, not that well organized or anything. The uh, Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, who are kind of in the process of shortening their party name to just Republicans. I've told you this before, and I will again later. They're not the Republicans of today. They are, in fact, the institutional ancestors of the Democrats of today. Although, <laughs> there are other differences. Uh, the Republicans of 220 years ago uh, wanted uh, smaller government, lower taxes, that sort of thing. <laughs> So 200 years ago, Democrats called themselves Republicans and wanted lower taxes and smaller government. What a thing. Anyway, it's almost a replay of 1796. But President Adams is the choice of the Federalists again. And uh, this time his running mate is Charles C. Pinckney from South Carolina. Four years earlier, it had been Thomas Pinckney from South Carolina. They were brothers. <coughs> and the uh, Democratic Republicans once again rallied around Thomas Jefferson of Virginia and Aaron Burr of New York. Okay. Um, the Federalists are in deep trouble, and they know it. Okay. They had enacted some controversial laws when they had uh, majorities in both houses of, the, of Congress and Adams in the White House. Uh, the, the various alien acts, aliens meaning not space aliens, but people from outside the United States coming in. The United States would not have any immigration laws at all for another like 80 or 90 years. Um, but some of these were so extreme that even, even Alexander Hamilton, the arch conservative himself, foreign born, could not, could not support them. They were in trouble on that. They had uh, prepared feverishly to go to war against France Back at the time of the XYZ affair in about 1798, those war preparations had been discredited because uh, President Adams, and you know, sometimes this works well, Adams, a true Federalist, it really didn't matter to him at all whether he's popular or not. Uh, he's, he's, there to, he's there to serve the public interest and to do right. This time he did. Uh, having received information through back channels that France was not going to, you know, try to insult us anymore and that they would accept... Uh, new emissaries, uh, so we sent a, a total of three more men, including one that was already over there, to Paris. They found that their situation, political situation, which was kaleidoscopic anyway, that had changed. A new a bunch of revolutionaries were in, much more conservative than the ones before. Uh, revolutions always come to a conservative reaction. But um, Napoleon uh, is in charge. And so we settled everything nicely. He let us off the hook of our uh, treaties from the late 1770s and their sweetness and light. Uh, so that looked bad. Plus, it was rather obvious that there's no place you could send American soldiers to fight Frenchmen. Anyway, what the Federalists had in mind was to send them out to fight the Democratic Republicans who were pro-French. They'll do. We just fight them. So they're preparing to deploy the United States Army against the other political party. We haven't sunk that low yet, hopefully. Well, uh, so the Federalists are divided into bitterly estranged factions within the party. You have an Adams wing and you have a Hamilton wing. Hamilton and Adams are not buddies. Okay, uh, so they did the only thing they could do, and it's all too boringly familiar today. It's called going negative. Uh, if it's too hard to get the voter to vote for you and your program, what you do is try to get them to vote against the other guys. That is very much like what the Democrats did in the election that's not quite finally settled yet, as I speak on November 11th, 2020. Um, they really didn't say much of anything that was anything other than empty platitudes about what they meant to do. If they actually came out and said what they meant to do, they'd be stabbing themselves in the, in the back. So it's all about how much they hated the president. Anyway, um, they turned three grains of truth about Jefferson into mountains of falsehood, to a greater or lesser degree. Okay, 
uh, Jefferson had supported the French Revolution through its darkest period, that being in the early 1790s. You had the Reign of Terror, followed by the Great Terror. When these are revolutionaries, they always get into a purity contest. And they were chopping people's heads off left and right. A five-figure number of Frenchmen, French women, and a few French children were beheaded. We have a very efficient device called the guillotine we don't have time to talk about. Um, and it got so bad that the only way you could even begin to guarantee your personal security, and that was being perfect, was to be an informant. So you rat somebody out, maybe they won't chop your head off. Um, but people could, people were getting their heads chopped off because they were overheard complaining about the price of bread. But Jefferson and Madison had somehow supported that. They claim not to support the terrorism, but they're supporting the revolutionaries. Now, you're a Federalist. Do you want to bet your life that if Jefferson wins, he will not bring the horrors of the French Revolution to America and set up guillotines on town squares across the land and start beheading Federalists? It happened in France. They're supposedly civilized. And if you're, a, if you're a Federalist who is prepared to send the U.S. Army to fight Jefferson's party, it becomes pretty believable, doesn't it? Okay. Another thing, the French revolutionaries were notoriously and aggressively atheistic. That's part of what they were rebelling against. The, the Catholic Church, which had dominated France, had, had no um, natural predators to keep it in line, and it was... There was a great deal of what's called anti-clericalism, opposing the priesthood as much as anything. But they're very atheistic, so it was assumed that Jefferson is one of them, and he's also an atheist, and that uh, it's whispered about. This wasn't real public, but it's kind of behind-the-scenes whispering. If Jefferson wins, the government men are going to come around and confiscate all the Bibles and burn them in big bonfires. That's wildly unrealistic, as it turned out, but... Jefferson is one of the scariest presidential candidates in the whole history of the United States. There's not been another one who had people trying to figure out where they could hide their Bible if he won. Okay. He was accused of fathering numerous mulatto mixed-race children by his slave women. Now, if you're a blue-nosed Federalist Pecksniffian from New England somewhere, and you don't want to admit it to yourself, but you know what you'd do if you had slave women... <laughs> it seemed believable. Now, the, uh, the the grain of truth, to back it up, Jefferson, the, the other th three, two things, Jefferson did support the revolutionaries, but uh, he said he did not support the violence. He just said, well, when you try to root out something that old and evil, it's going to get messy. Uh, the thing about the uh, religion, Jefferson had authored the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty when he was governor of that state. He was so proud of that achievement that he had that carved on his tombstone a quarter of a century later. Um, he didn't put anything about the Declaration of Independence or anything like that. So you have that. And uh, But the thing about uh, slave women, here's the deal. It's a bit of a backstory. Um, uh, Jefferson didn't marry until he was in his 20s, a little bit late for those days, and he finally married a widow who bore him like five or six children, uh, only two of whom survived childhood. They were both daughters. But uh, she was not a healthy woman, and she's cranking out babies every other year, and it, it got to her. She died uh, just shy of her 34th birthday in the early 1780s. Before that, Jefferson really wouldn't accept any assignments that took him away from home for very long because his wife's sick, and you know what's going to happen there. Now, on her deathbed, she is very afraid that that she, she knows she's going to die. She can't stand the thought of having her precious daughters raised by an unsympathetic stepmother. So she required her husband to swear an oath to her that he would never remarry. She died. Jefferson lived 44 more years, but he never did remarry. Well, <clears throat> I don't have to be explicit here. Now, Jefferson then accepted an assignment to go to France, to Paris, to be a diplomatic representative. 
While he's there, he sent word back to Virginia to have his two young daughters sent over to live with him there. Okay, one of them already knew him. They'd recruited an older woman to be the chaperone. She got sick, so ship's about to sail. They tabbed a, a young slave woman named Sally Hemings to be the chaperone. Sally Hemings with one M. Um, so she shows up with the two daughters. Sally Hemings, uh, there's evidence to suggest that she was light-skinned. She was, in fact, Jefferson's late wife's half-sister. <laughs> so Jefferson's father-in-law had been doing what Jefferson was accused of doing. Uh, and very, very attractive young woman. And apparently, behind the scenes, a thing got going between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. The romantic version of this is that these two people shared a lifelong, mutually exclusive relationship which they could not even acknowledge, let alone make official. Because Sally Hemings was still alive at the time of Jefferson's death in 1826. When time came for him to return to Virginia, she didn't have to come with him because once she gets off the boat in France, she's not a slave anymore. France never recognized slavery. She did go back with him. He did promise to get her to do that. He promised he would free any children she bore him uh, when they came of age. And she bore him like five children. Uh, so Jefferson's descend male descendants today are all through Sally Hemings. Okay. So um, the realistic version is that Jefferson probably kept Sally Hemings as a concubine. His biographers say there's not a single word indicating any any kind of affection for her of anything or anything like that in his writings. Say, I don't know if I'd just been Jefferson, I don't know what think I would live left documentary evidence if, even if I had. But there you go. Now this this was whispered about. So that charge was brought against Jefferson. Now the way it went public was after, after a couple of years after the election, Jefferson had hired a Scotsman named James Callender with two L's to invent and and published just malicious vile canards against John Adams and the Federalists, still thinking they could be good buddies in person. And uh, Jefferson and Callender had a disagreement over how much Callender would get paid, and Callender broke the story of Sally Hemings. Hmm. He was later found drowned in four feet of water. Go figure. Actually, he hit the bottle pretty heavy, and that's probably what the deal was there. So uh, it wasn't enough, okay? Uh, when the electoral votes were counted, Jefferson had 73 electoral votes, Adams only 65. But that's, that's where the, the election got screwed up, all right? In those days, the elections through the election of 1800, with the presidential electors would each cast votes for two different people for president, for president, okay? The, the Constitution writers had not known that there would be political parties to narrow the choice down. So whoever got the most electoral votes would be the president, as long as the number they got was more than half of all the electors. Uh, the second place finisher would be the vice president. Um, anyway, if nobody gets a majority, or if there's a tie, it goes to the House of Representatives, which then, voting by states, uh, chooses the president. There's 16 states by then, so it'll take nine to win. Now, what, how, what put us there? All 73 Republican electors voted for Jefferson, and all 73 of them also voted for Aaron Burr. The deal was one of the electors is supposed to throw away the second vote. Either he didn't get the memo or there's something going on, but that's a tie. It went to the House, still dominated by Federalists, who had, they were lame ducks, okay? They had lost their re-election bids, but their terms aren't over. The House voted 35 times inconclusively, with eight for Jefferson, six for Burr, and two evenly split. And it's kind of to inaugurate somebody. But eventually, one of the old Federalists who would have voted for Satan hot from hell before he'd have voted for Thomas Jefferson was persuaded just to stay in his hotel one day and not go down to the Capitol and Jefferson became the third president of the United States. <sighs> the great screwed up election of 1800.